Released by Square in 1992 on the Super NES, series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi returns to write and direct the next installment in the Final Fantasy franchise, though this would be the last installment he directs. For characters, the game opted to combine elements of the third and fourth installments, that is, have pre-made characters with their own story and drama, but allow players to customize their individual growth. For gameplay, this game is known best for improving the class system advanced in the third game. Each party member can select one of 22 possible classes as their job, then further equip an additional ability they have learned from any job they have, thus allowing deeper strategic party management. In addition, the ATB timer is now a visible meter, allowing players to see turn order and plan ahead, and the game debuted a few series staple jobs and their abilities. The Beastmaster with monster control, the Mime with its mimicry, the Time Mage with his dimensional magic, and the Blue Mage with his learned monster special attacks. This is also the debut of the series' first recurring mini-boss, Gilgamesh. Keep in mind this footage is the original Japanese release, fan translated to English, as the original American release was not seen until an anthology collection, so don't mind spelling discrepancies. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. The game begins with the King of Tycoon sensing something wrong with the Wind Crystal, and after calming his daughter Alina, he flies off on his Wind Dragon Hiryu. He's not the only one to sense something amiss, as at the same time we see the pirate captain Ferris and a mysterious old man, also sensing that the wind has stopped. Lina's worries are well founded, as the King of Tycoon checks in on the Wind Crystal just in time to see it shattered before his eyes. Apart from all of this, a young adventurer named Bartz is camping with his trusty mount Boko the Chocobo, when suddenly a meteor crashes nearby and they move to investigate. Saving Princess Lena from some goblins, he introduces himself, and the two of them suddenly hear the groaning of an old man nearby. Helping him up, he discovers he's lost all memory except for his name, Galoof. Lena states she's in a hurry to the Wind Shrine, and Galoof suddenly feels compelled to get to the Wind Shrine too. Bartz doesn't care, so at first he lets them go on their way, but it isn't too long before he finds himself rushing in again to save them from goblins and pitfalls caused by the aftershocks of the meteor. As they recover, Lena insists on going to the shrine, and Bartz decides to accompany her there, while also explaining his motivation for adventuring, and so the trio is formed. After stepping through a newly formed cave due to the meteor and visiting a healing spring within, they spot a ship somehow sailing without the wind, and see it docking nearby. Moving closer, they enter the hideout for the same pirate crew, and though Lena suggests asking them to ferry them to the shrine, Galoof suggests outright stealing the ship for themselves. However, the ship doesn't move at all, and they are caught red-handed by the captain and crew. Lena reveals herself to be Tycoon's princess, apologizes for the attempted theft, and asks for a ride to the wind shrine. Ferris laughs and states he intends to hold her for ransom, though pauses when noticing Lena's pendant. Finding themselves tied up and in the brig, the three teammates banter, while at the same time, Ferris is questioning why Lena also has an identical pendant as him. The next day, Ferris declares they're all going to the wind shrine and to cut free the prisoners to the shock of everyone. Ferris also states he intends to help them and explains that the ship can sail despite a lack of wind thanks to being hitched to his friendly pet sea serpent, Sildra. Arriving at the Wind Shrine, Lena finds royal attendants there to explain the power of the crystal has left, and now monsters flood the temple with the king himself still on the top floor. Fighting their way up, they defeat even a menacing Wing Raptor to gain entry to the Wind Crystal Room. Finding it shattered, the crystal shards suddenly flare up with light, and now the light of the remaining crystals suddenly send power to the four adventurers. To Ferris goes the courage of fire, to Lena goes the kindness of water, to Galoof goes the hope of earth, and the lingering spirit of the Wind Crystal gives Bartz with the enduring passion. The new four warriors of light are astonished at the sudden power, and now the King of Tycoon comes out and informs them that while they have been chosen, the remaining crystals will also soon shatter. Their mission is to prevent that, and thus the world from being plunged into darkness, and as he disappears, the crystal shards impart the knowledge of the past heroes of light into the new generation, granting them the jobs of the Knight, Black Belt, Blue Mage, Thief, Black Mage, and White Mage. Sailing to the town of Tool, the crew takes a rest, and Bartz and Galoof walk in on Ferris sleeping, uncovering that Ferris may be hiding an overt secret on his chest after all. At night, Bartz recalls an old memory of his father, once on an important mission with the Crystals as well. The next morning, Ferris dismisses the pirates back to their headquarters, and as the party sails off, they are caught in an abnormal whirlpool that suddenly sucks them all in. It turns out to be the trap of the fearsome monster Karlapos, and as the party fights it, their ship is cut free of the whirlpool, though Sildra is dragged under by a dying Karlapos. The ship is adrift, and the warriors find themselves moored in the infamous ship graveyard, where many other crews have found their doom. After wading through some storm-tossed wreckage, the party decides to dry off. Lena goes to change, and the guys make a fire to warm them up too. Ferris is reluctant, and when the two guys try to drag Ferris over, they confirm their suspicions earlier that Ferris is actually a girl pretending to be a man this entire time. 
She confesses it was to keep up a more intimidating role as a pirate, but asserts it doesn't make her any less dangerous. Moving on, Bart suddenly sees his mother apparate in front of them, and Lena sees her father. As Bart's Lena and Ferris move closer, they are suddenly put under a spell, and now a young girl claiming to be Galoof's granddaughter comes out. Galoof doesn't recognize her, and when the spell fails, now a siren comes out to claim the souls of his comrades. Galoof slaps his friends awake to reclaim themselves and their souls, and the party moves to end this undead in disguise. Now traveling to the town of Carwin, they learn of the country of Waris across the southern sea is home to that of the Water Crystal, but without Sildra or the Wind, sailing is not an option. They also learn that at the northern mountain there is an armored wind dragon sighted, which Lena figures must be her father's. Hearing it went there for the healing herbs that grow there, Lena worries it may be injured and Bart's figures they can use to fly south, so they hurry to the north mountain next. Climbing the mountain, Lena spots her father's helmet, but is suddenly struck by the poisonous arrow of a poacher hunting the last wind dragon. The mountain begins to crumble, but Ferris not only jumps the gap, but also climbs the side of the mountain, crafts a rope bridge, and rescues Lena. Defeating the poacher Magisa and her companion Forza, they find the wounded wind dragon Hirio ahead and heal it. Flying atop the wind dragon despite Bart's sphere of heights, they travel across the sea to the kingdom of Waris. There, they learn the king has been siphoning power from the crystal to create wealth and prosperity for the people, and meet with him to urge him to stop before the crystal shatters as well. He hears them out, but doesn't believe the crystal is so fragile. Suddenly, another meteor crashes down dangerously close to the Tower of Waris, where the water shrine is. Moving to secure the crystal, the king goes personally with his royal guard to check on his precious crystal. The party follows, but not before hearing the plea of an imprisoned thief named Lone Wolf, whom they choose to let free of his prison. In addition, behind a waterfall behind the castle, they find a shrine to the icy Esper Shiva and gain her aid after proving their worth in battle. Now making their way to the Tower of Wolus and climbing it, they find the King's Guard defeated by the mind-controlled guardian Galura. Defeating it, they find they are too late and the water crystal shatters. What more, a dying soldier recognizes Galoof and says to save the fire crystal next, though dies before any questions on Galoof's identity can be answered. Fortunately, the shards still convey their power to the warriors in the jobs of Berserker, Red Mage, Summoner, Mystic Knight, and Time Mage. As the entire tower and peninsula sink into the ocean, the party is almost dragged under as well, except they are saved just in time by Sildra, who is still barely alive. After dragging them off at the coast, Sildra is still too mortally wounded to continue and drifts away to die in peace. Exploring the new meteor, they find a teleportation device inside, and taking it warps them to a corresponding device in the first meteor that dropped. Continuing onward to the kingdom of Karnak, where the fire crystal is, they learn of the engineer Sid, who is also amplifying the crystal's power to a dangerous level per the queen's orders, despite warnings not to. Suddenly, they are called out by a villager who claims to have spotted them coming out of the meteor as well, and some guards imprison them. They are charged with being werewolves, as it was a werewolf that came from the same meteor a little before them. In jail, the prisoner in the nearby cell blows up his wall only to find it's filled with Bart's party, much to his disappointment. He introduces himself as Sid and accepts responsibility for everything going wrong with the crystals, as he learned and applied forgotten lore of the crystal's power from the legendary ancient library. It was his machines that empowered the four crystals and helped society thrive, but drove the crystals to the point of shattering. When he realized this, he tried to shut down his machines but was caught and jailed instead. The party then reveals their roles as the four warriors of light, which astonishes Sid. However, it's not long when the royal minister comes out and releases Sid, as Sid was right and their own fire crystal has begun to crack. They shut down the machine tied to it, but they need his help to save the crystal which is still outputting too much energy. Sid gets the team released as well, and they move to meet him at the steamship, which Sid thinks may be the problem. In town, they find the fire crystal has begun spewing flames around the entire castle, the queen is missing, and the werewolf they released earlier is being chased away by the guard. On the steamship, Sid confirms the crystal will shatter if they don't stop the engine of the ship, which is still siphoning power from the fire crystal. Making their way to the power room, they find the missing Queen Karnak herself, though she herself suddenly becomes cloaked in darkness and summons a massive monster of flame to kill the party. Defeating it defeats the engine of the steamship and breaks the darkness cloaking the queen, who reveals some dark spirit was possessing her and something beyond the machines is also breaking the crystals. There is a pipe leading directly to the crystal room from there, and upon arrival, Lone Wolf also breaks in, relieved the crystal is still intact. He also recognizes Galoof, but before he can explain more, a possessed soldier comes in to reactivate the machine. The pipes reconnect to the crystal, and Lone Wolf moves to at least delay the crystal from exploding long enough for the party to escape. Despite their efforts to save him, the party escapes and Lone Wolf is burned alive by the shattering of the fire crystal. 
However, after the burst of flame, the fires all die down with the crystal, and the party has 10 minutes to flee to Castle Karnak before it explodes from all the machine failure. Successfully escaping, a few crystal shards fly off, but a few still find their way to them and grant them the jobs Beastmaster, Geomancer, and Ninja. The explosion broke down the wall, blocking the way to the ancient library Sid mentioned, so they head there next for more information on the crystals. Immediately upon entering, they hear that Sid's grandson, Mid, has gone missing in the pursuit of a book, and the monsters have entered the basement. After reading the Tome of Ifri, battling him and gaining him as a summon, they eventually find Mid in the basement, but not before fending off a Biblos monster that animated from the pages of a book. It turns out Mid was in no real danger, and has learned a way to operate the steamship without crystal power. Finding Sid still in a state of deep depression, Mid comes in to snap his grandfathers to his senses with some endearment and science. Back in the game, Sid and Mid work to overhaul the steamship and allow it to transport the warriors to the Earth Crystal. Meanwhile, seeing them together reminds Galoof of his past, and the name Kara comes to him, as well as other memories. He recalls now that he comes from another world, traveled here on a meteor, and held the mission to prevent the return of a great evil mage named X-Death, who once was sealed 30 years ago. In addition, should the four crystals shatter, then their seal on X-Death will end and he'll return as well. With the steamship overhaul now complete, the ship can sail wind and crystal free, and the warriors now sail to Crescent Island, where upon arrival a sudden earthquake causes a whirlpool that sinks the steamship, but also learn of a forest of black chocobos nearby. Catching one of the elusive and near-extinct birds, they discover it has the two missing shards of the fire crystal, conveniently enough, and thus gain the bard and ranger jobs. As black chocobos can fly, they use this one to travel back to the ancient library and inform Sid and Mid of the loss of the steamship, which they dismiss as they can just build another one. More importantly, they have news for them, as King Tycoon has been sighted leaving Karnak and heading into the quicksand desert. Witnesses say he was somehow floating and heading to the city ruins rumored to lie there. Once there, the engineers say to try killing a sandworm and using its body as a bridge. Doing so, they find the plan works, and ride the rest of the way on the currents of the sand rivers. Once across, they do find a ruined city, spot an evasive King Tycoon, and follow him. After Ferris lets drop that she believes King Tycoon is a long-lost father based on her pendant, following turns out to be a trap, and even after falling, Lena is glad to have found her long-lost sister. Moving on, they find a surprising amount of ancient machinery still operating here, and suddenly they are all teleported away to below Crescent Island. Escaping with the platform collapsing behind them, they gain some fortune by means of Sid and Mid returning their black chocobo to its native forest on the same island. Pushing a lever not only drops Sid and Mid down, but also opens up more areas of the fully furnished underground bunker. They find not only their sunken steamship somehow docked and safe and sound here, but also a strange ship with propellers on it. Tinkering with the ancient machine, Sid manages to resurrect the airship and up they go. However, a giant Crayclaw identical to Carlabos has latched itself to this ship and they defeat it to knock it off. After repairing it again with parts from the steamship, the group is finally underway again to hunting for the Earth Crystal. To their surprise, the buried ancient city beneath the desert rises up and floats above their reach, and returning to Sid and Mid learn that the Earth Crystal is powering that floating city, and will soon shatter for it. After traveling to the town of Istory and battling the Esper of Lightning Rama for his summon, they visit Tycoon Castle, and Ferris remembers how she was Princess Cerisa before she fell into the sea and lost her memory, a story that's actually confirmed by their old nursemaid. For now, they agree it's best not to reveal that fact to the castle. After reinforcing the hull of their ship with some adamantium for the meteor Galoof came in, they are able to reach the city, though they can only land after destroying the defensive guns. Descending the depths of the floating city, they finally find the King of Tycoon struggling against the monster and choose to help him defeat it. However, it was actually a guardian beast to the Earth Crystal, and they realize their mistake too late as the possessed king moves to destroy it. However, at this moment, another meteor crashes into the floating city and a little girl comes out and quickly knocks out King Tycoon. As the girl greets Galoof, suddenly his amnesia lifts and his memory is restored, beginning with recognizing his granddaughter, Kara. Kara's strike also knocked the king to his senses again, and he also recognizes his long-lost daughter, Cerisa. However, all is not well as Bartz notices the crystal shattering, and instantly the Dark Mage X-Death is free. He makes an appearance before Galoof to gloat, and to show his power, summons the crystals himself to blast back Bartz. He announces his intention to drag the world into the void and disappears, and the King of Tycoon uses the last of his own power to stop the out-of-control crystals. Unfortunately, he dies. But the crystals do end up sharing their power with the warriors, imparting the last jobs of Samurai, Dragoon, Dancer, and Chemist. Escaping away on their airship, the ruined city is destroyed as it crashes to the ground below. 
Galuth now explains that Xdeath came from his own world 30 years ago to destroy the crystals, but was stopped by himself and three others also blessed by the crystals, and together they were the Warriors of Dawn. Though they are the same ones coming back again on the meteors, he regrets now that they didn't bring back Xdeath back with them and seal them on their own planet. Now both worlds are in trouble. And so, Galuth and Kara ride their teleporter back to their planet to battle Xdeath, but cannot take the party as there is not enough energy. However, Lena and Ferris want to avenge their father, so they seek out Sid for help, who coincidentally was already in another meteor trying to get it functional again. After defeating the Esper Titan, they gain a summon as well as the Adamantium from the other meteors, enough to power a one-way teleporting trip to Galuth's world. Traveling to the New World and camping for the night, the group is immediately ambushed and captured by the minions of Xdeath. His taunting of them is short, as he learns Galoof is ready to attack with his army. However, Xdeath prepares a magic mirror that projects his image as well as those of his new hostages, and forces Galoof to back down. However, Galoof is the veteran Dawn Warrior and Light Warrior, and he only pulls back his army as he himself rides a Wind Dragon to the top of Xdeath's castle to launch a solo rescue. He duels with Gilgamesh, one of Xdeath's top generals, and wins through Gilgamesh being unprepared at this time. They escape the castle, wade their way through the battle on the big bridge, encounter the Weapon Master Gilgamesh once again, and after his excuse making, he beats a quick escape before they can beat him again. They are unable to escape the effects of the barrier now thrown up around the castle and are all hurled to the distant wildlands of Gosiana. Entering a strange forest, they are surprised to encounter a rare Moogle. They follow it, save it from a skeletal Tyrosaurus, and it thanks them by leading them to its hidden Moogle village and relays their location to the Moogle living in Galoof's castle. Kara rescues them from the Wind Dragon, and Bards is still surprised to learn that Galoof really was the King of Ball. They learn the Wind Dragon has saved them is injured, and move to find some Hiryu plant, and pass through the town of Kelp to do so. They learn it's a town of werewolves, like their friend Lone Wolf, and their leader Kelgar was once a Dawn Warrior ally of Galoof's. However, Kelgar suspects Bards and crew may have sabotaged the crystal to shatter, and duels him, with Bards winning with a signature move his father taught him. Furthermore, Bartz learns his father Dorgan was also went to Dawn Warrior with Galoof and Kelgar, and also opposed sealing to Xdeath on another world, therefore opting to stay behind and watch over the seal. Later, they find the Hiryu plant, kill its assumed monstrous form, and use it to heal their own Wind Dragon. They then find Kara bedridden due to headaches from a psychic calling of Gido, a 700-year-old sage who predicted this crisis with the crystals, so they choose to answer in person. Taking the newly healed Wind Dragon, they travel to Sage Gido's island, but a sudden earthquake caused by Xdeath sinks the entire island. At this time, Galoof thinks to visit his nearby friend and last Dawn warrior, Zeza, who is left with the powerful naval force he intends to take on Xdeath with. They catch up with the fleet, introduce themselves, and prepare for the invasion. However, Gilgamesh strikes back with a preemptive raid catching them off guard, this time with the aid of his partner Enkidu. They fight, but only to a draw as Gilgamesh retreats once more and pulls back his forces. At this time, Zeza shows them a secret weapon, a submarine, and actually sneaks into the barrier tower from below the sea while the enemy focuses on the decoy fleet. Once inside, they split up, intending to not only shut down the power to the tower, but also smash the antenna projecting the barrier, and Zeza hands them an echoing device to stay in communication. Once Zeza succeeds on his end, the party is in place to destroy the barrier, but a creature of space and time, Atmos, is waiting for them. Defeating Atmos, they also destroy the antenna, but unfortunately the contained energy in the power room overloads and traps Zeza. He admits he knew all along his route would be one way, and dies as the room explodes. Bart is forced to knock an enraged Galoof out in order to get them all to safety, as the barrier does indeed fall, and once on the submarine, Ferris suggests using it to reach Sage Kido's sunken cave. They make it inside the submerged cavern, and Bart is surprised to find that Sage Kido is actually a giant turtle they find there. Gido quickly advises them to travel to the living forest of Moor where Xdeath was actually created 500 years ago, and this time to destroy Xdeath instead of sealing him. He also warns them that Xdeath is there right now searching for something, and also the living forest attacks all who enter indiscriminately. Giving them the means to enter the forest, they head off and make their way to the magical woods. However, while still exploring, a wildfire suddenly appears and begins devouring the entire living woods, and they figure it must be Xdeath's doing. They seem to be trapped by the flames when suddenly a Moogle comes out of hiding and leads them away to safety. After the fire subsides, they find the Master Tree which responds to the item Gido gave them and they enter. Within, four mysterious crystals surround and attack the group, and after defeating their assailants, Xdeath thanks them for unknowingly destroying the Guardians to the seal to the crystals of this world. Now, Xdeath has taken command of the power that once bound him and begins killing the party under the might of the crystals. 
Elsewhere, Kara was notified by her Moogle that the group was in trouble in the forest of Moor, and rode the Wit Dragon over there, getting there just in time to interrupt x -Death. He retaliates by seizing her and slamming her against the walls of the cave to kill her as well. At this time, Galoof, the King of Ball, Warrior of Dawn of this world, Warrior of Light in the other world, and Kara's grandfather, shatters the crystal binding him, and takes the full brunt of x -Death's binding magic to save Kara. Even after that, he attacks the Dark Mage head-on, refusing to fall when by all accounts he should be dead on his feet. Even x -Death is surprised a bit, but claims he cannot be killed by anger and hatred, so Galoof's vengeance will not help him. But, as he manages to strike a fatal blow against x -Death, Galoof explains it was never hatred in the first place. x -Death indeed falls, but he absorbs the remaining three crystals to save himself and uses this time to flee. By the time the other warriors recover, it's too late for Galoof, and as he fades, despite their every spell and item to save him, he uses his last breath to urge them to defeat x -Death and dies. Kara is devastated, but suddenly hears Galoo's voice, who passes on his power and strength to her entirely, gives her comforting words, and passes his mission on to her as a new Warrior of Light. Heading straight to x -Death's castle next, they are soon halted by his illusions. At the same time, Kelgar is not long for this world as he acknowledges he is the last of the Dawn Warriors, though the spirit of Galoof comes to him, imparts Kara's situation, and now he finds the strength to fight one more time against x -Death. He uses the last of his own life to lift the illusionary veil over the castle and reveal it for what it truly is, and allow the party to move on through its hellish halls. Further in, they gain the Esper Carbuncle and encounter Gilgamesh, and upon beating him for the fourth time, he assumes his true legendary form as a Master at Arms and Legendary Weapons Collector. However, when he declares using a legendary Excalibur Blade, he finds he came ill-equipped with the Excalibur instead, and as a punishment, x who was looking on, banishes Gilgamesh from this dimension. Confronting x now, the Dark Mage questions if they even know what they are fighting for, or what they are even trying to stop him from doing, and the party admits they really don't. He explains he intends to return the world to how it used to be, but they still fight. Furthermore, while they win, the remaining crystals of this world shatter and break. They are all knocked unconscious, and suddenly, they all wake up somehow outside Castle Tycoon. Talking to the Chancellor, they find this really is their original world. Apparently, they're all in time for a sudden banquet to not only honor the fallen king, but also the return of Princess Cerisa. So during the festivities, which tie up Lena and Ferris, Kara and Bart steal away to investigate why they return so suddenly at all. Fetching his trusty chocobo steed, Boko, who actually started a family while he's been away, Bart's and Kara ride onwards, get caught in an antlion pit, fight their way out, and are pulled out by Ferris. With Kara catching a splinter on the way out, the trio ride on and are surprised to run into Sage Guido, who knows the worlds have been remerged, like what x -Death said earlier. He explains the legend that 1,000 years ago, the two worlds were originally one, but were split to seal off the power of the Void, a force once wielded by an evil entity named Enuo. Enuo was defeated with the 12 legendary weapons, but the Void he created still lingered. They found that by splitting the world's four crystals, the resulting dual sets of crystals created two separate worlds as well, and within the dimensional space left between the two worlds, they sealed the void. Not only was x -Death right, but with the crystals gone, the worlds are re-merged with the forces of nature dead again. Suddenly, x -Death emerges from Kara's splinter, having followed them this whole time, and declares his intent to wield the power of the void himself. At the same time, a pocket of the void opens up, engulfing Tycoon Castle with Lena still in it, and closes, leaving nothing behind. He prepares to kill the party, but Sage Guido interrupts him and fights on par with x -Death himself for a while. The Dark Mage forces a font of power that hurls everyone away, but they all reconvene safely outside. Guido spots the ancient library, which was a lost legend in his world, and explains the book they need with the method to defeat x -Death isn't there. Upon entering, Zeza's scholars from Sergei Castle are already there and even have the specific book they need conveniently ready for them. Calling a meeting of all scholarly minds in the Warriors of Light, Guido informs them that before they enter the Cleft of Dimension, they must gather the 12 sealed legendary weapons that previously defeated Enuo and use them to kill x -Death once and for all. The sealed book they hand them was once split in two, but now is whole and can show the way to the weapons, which incidentally will only do so to the Light Warriors. However, to break the seals of the twelve weapons within the castle of Kuzar, they first need four tablets, each one protected by one of the four elements, and the ultimate black-white time and summon magic, Flare, Holy, Meteor, and Leviathan and Bahamut, respectively. Though the clues on whereabouts of the four tablets are vague, Guido already knows that the Earth Tablet is in the Quicksand Desert's pyramid. As they travel out, they note the living forest is already regenerating itself, but the Master Tree is still a reminder of those they lost. 
Crossing the desert is easier, as the quicksand river stopped when the earth crystals shattered, and collecting the first tablet causes the King of Dragons to appear, whose very arrival causes an entire peninsula to sink into the sea. Bahamut says he'll be waiting to test them when they're ready, and his movements cause their lost airship to drift their way. In addition, on their way back, the Wind Dragon swoops in and drops off Lena, whom they thought lost to the void. However, as they move to help her up, it turns out she's actually been possessed by the demon Melusine, who escaped from the void when Tycoon Castle was swallowed up. XF comes out to taunt them, and then chooses to get rid of the ancient library and sage Guido with his growing control of the void. He leaves to let Lena kill them all, but Hiryu sacrifices itself to knock out Lena, which somehow forces out the demoness. So the party attacks, defeating Melusine and freeing Lena. Bart and the three ladies are all reunited again, and as they return to the airship, they see the void where Castle Tycoon once was, is the entrance of the cleft death dimension. At the same time, Exet discovers to himself that he can't actually control the void himself, and it has so far only been somewhat guiding it. So now, many towns, castles, and their inhabitants are getting devoured by the Void, with the most recent victims being the hidden Moogle village in Bart's hometown of Lix. After calming down from a wave of rage, they find the sealed castle of Kuzar and use their tablet to unlock a few of the sealed legendary weapons. Now that they have weapons that threaten X-Death, X-Death himself releases more of his strongest warriors out into the world to interfere with the Light Warriors while he focuses on mastering control over the Void. Traveling on, the party finds the lost town of Mirage, once lost entirely to the Void 1000 years ago, and learn that Enuo actually lost his invulnerability in exchange for the power of the Void. Then, after visiting a solitary island temple, they visit the Stalker Stoker, and gain the second tablet. Unlocking the way to Fork Tower next, they learn they must split up and take the two ultimate white and black spells at the same time, else the tower will explode. So, for the first time, the player controls two separate parties at the same time, and after defeating the Guardian Minotauros and Omniscient, they gain Holy and Flare. And the entire tower disappears, revealing the hangar to the ruined city. Venturing in, they discover Sid and Mid are still there, and have even discovered how to integrate the submarine functionality into their airship. Though, Mid reveals Sid is still haunted by the abuse of his inventions in the past, which is why he is so passionate to help the Light Warriors. Using their new vessel to descend to the depths of the Great Trench, below even the ocean floor, they discover the remnants of the lost Dwarven Kingdom, with a few residents still alive. Beyond them, they fight three demonic pigs and defeat them all in order to claim the third tablet and the magic spell Meteor. Moving on to the world's largest waterfall, the Istory Falls, they explore the cascades behind it and claim the final tablet. However, when leaving, another Exodus minions ambush them, but he is instantly killed by the mighty Leviathan just behind him. Seeking to test the party, the White Warriors battle the Master of Waves, and upon winning, gain his service as a summon. Afterwards, they return to the Cave of Jacol, challenge the Esper Odin to battle, and defeat him in under a minute, thus gaining his aid as a summon. Then, they travel to the sunken Tower of Wolus, where the Water Crystal originally was, and as Bartz holds his breath for an impressive 7 minutes, they encounter the curious Gogo the Mine, and after defeating him at his own game, he creates his own exit to the Cleft of Dimension, and they gain the final job from the Water Crystal, Mimic. Now visiting her old pirate headquarters, Ferris sees Sildra still in the water, but it's only her, and though he's still dead, he still wants to help and becomes an esper to join them on their mission. Now grabbing a black chocobo from Mirage Town, they make their way to Phoenix Tower, where at the top, they find Lena's Wind Dragon Hiryu, somehow still barely alive. It still wants to help, so it uses the last of its life to set itself on fire in the Phoenix Tower, and rise again as the Esper, Phoenix. Now ready, they challenge the King of Dragons and Espers himself, Bahamut, and battle him to prove their worth to command his power as a summon. With all the tablets in hand, the Light Warriors gain the remainder of the 12 legendary weapons, and are now equipped to enter the Cleft of Dimension and kill X-Death. What they find within are terrain remnants from every building and land ever consumed by the Void, and they soon find themselves fighting the remaining leaders under Exdeath's command, and rushing through every boss leading up to the King of Dimensional Castle, Holly Karnassos. However, beyond is the seat of the Void itself, and their first challenger is the exiled warrior, Gilgamesh, who has gone mad with battling monsters from between the dimensions itself. During their fight, he slowly regains his sanity, and Bartz chooses to help him out, showing him not only how to leave this dimensional rift, but also promising to meet again next time as friends. Gilgamesh accepts and steps down, now freed of his prison. Beyond, the party encounters Necrophobia, a foe with barriers that render him nearly invincible. However, during the fight, Gilgamesh comes in as well, refusing to let his new friends fight alone. He offers them his thanks and encouragement, and self-destructs himself to take down Necrophobia and let the Light Warriors continue to their real fight. 
Finally confronting Xdev, he claims to have mastered control of the Void and becomes a massive world tree to absorb everything around him, including the Light Warriors themselves. In the vastness of space, however, the spirits of the Dawn Warriors come forth and tell the Light Warriors to defeat Xdev while they hold back the power of the Void. Both sets of Warriors of Crystal, and even the King of Tycoon, escape the Void and cooperate to drive a path to Xdev and battle the abomination the Dark Mage has become. Bartz, Lena, Ferris, and Kara use the legendary weapons to full effect to kill Xdev once and for all. However, at this time, the Void Xdev thought he controlled now comes out and takes control of him, evolving and taking the name Neo Xdev, with the sole mission of returning everything, even itself, to nothingness. Slaying the manifestation of raw chaos and pure nihilism, the Light Warriors succeed in winning, but despite killing Xdev, cannot seal even the remnants of the Void due to the lack of crystals. As the game concludes, the power of the crystals they've been holding and growing this entire time, with their spirits of hope, courage, kindness, and passion, release from within themselves to reform and reforge brand new crystals. The effects of the crystals immediately reverse the damage of the Void, as the world is essentially reborn. The old guard come out and wish the new generation well as they are returned to their reborn world and move onto their own separate ways. Bartz returns to a nomadic life as a wandering warrior, but is resting at his hometown until his next journey. Lena is taking care of Tycoon, though Ferris doesn't care much for the life of royalty and returns to her old life as pirate captain. Finally, Kara herself still corresponds to Sid and Mid about the state of things, as she herself helps with Castle Ball. As the game ends, it's been one year since their adventure to save the world, and Kara is paying her respects to Galoof at the Master Tree where he died. She reflects alone, and is surprised by all of her old friends, who assure her she's not alone in the world, and have not forgotten the loved ones that have passed. Together, the Light Warriors agree their job isn't over as they can still hear the crystals and leave together on a new journey. Final Fantasy V is the final installment to have been directed by the original creator of the Final Fantasy series, Hironobu Sakaguchi, whom, while was involved in dozens of RPGs since, would not direct another game until 20 years later with the last story for the Nintendo Wii. Final Fantasy V has enjoyed the success of selling over 3 million copies worldwide.